an eerie silence descended. Good morning, everyone. We might just wait a few moments just until we get a few people into the panel session. Um, so please bear with us, but um, we've got a really great session for you coming up and we'll, be, uh, we'll just hang out for a couple of moments just to make sure that we've got lots of people um, have joined us for this really exciting session, which will be um, coming to you in just a few minutes time. Seems really awkward of us all sort of sitting here, but we do want to make sure we've got lots of people. <laughs> you can see the people popping in. <laughs> yeah, they're coming through, slowly coming through. <laughs> it is a Saturday morning after all, and they might have just finished um, seeing that bash as well. So currently we're doing like awkward on stage banter, right? Yeah, this is what happens. <laughs> this is what it feels like to be a musician, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> on a topic of, uh, so how did you get here? You know, which that, we, that's off the table. We, we traffic was that. traffic was hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we might make a start because I feel like we've got we've got quite a few people through. So let's make a start, and I'm sure they'll continue to um, trickle on through. Um, as I said, good morning. Welcome to the Melbourne International Jazz Festival Career Development Panel. My name is Dean Worthington and I'll be your facilitator today. We've got a great panel of industry professionals here as we discuss old media and new media and how to utilise both for your arts practice. Um, today, the session will be closed captioned. And if you'd like to access the captioning, you can press the CC symbol at the bottom of your screen, which is depending on how it looks, it'll be down there somewhere. Um, I would like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet and broadcast from. For me, that's the people of the Kulin Nation. As I come to you from my home and what many refer to as Melbourne, I would also like to personally acknowledge the people of the Lachi Lachi and the neighbouring Barkindji as the traditional custodians of the land in which I was raised along the Murray River, known as the Mervine in, Sun, known as Mervine in the Sunraysia area. And from everyone here, at MIJF and the panelists joining us today, we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, as I've said, thank you for joining us. I personally was extremely honoured to be asked by the team at MIJF to facilitate this panel. It's a topic that is very dear to my heart as I was the former marketing development director just up until last year. Um, and I cannot tell you the amount of times that I said that we need to do more types of these workshops to help artists um, and musicians facilitate their way around what is sometimes a really quite daunting um, area of media, particularly when we're looking at new and old media. Um, for the sake of posterity, this session is being run live. It is on, it is Sunday the 27th of June, 2020. It's just after 11 a.m. Scott Morrison is the Australian Prime Minister. Donald Trump is in the White House. Jada Essence Hall is the reigning queen of RuPaul's Drag Race. And the world is being ravaged by a coronavirus titled COVID-19, which has changed the way in which all of us live and particularly within the creative industries has really um, decimated what is what our industry was. So this is a very long way of saying that if you're joining us via Zoom, you can ask questions by using the Q&A function, um, which is in your screens. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce these amazing people which we have got joining us here. Um, joining us is Michael Dwyer. Uh, Michael is an arts journalist, writer, musician, college lecturer and occasional broadcaster. He's survived 32 years at the intersection of music and media and has his fingers crossed for a 33rd. Paige X Cho is the senior music strategist at Bolster, who are a digital agency that specialises in music and culture. Paige has worked in the industry for over a decade and her current role involves strategy and implementation for projects like Elton John, Splendor in the Glass, Blues Fest, Laneway Festival, Adele, and many more. Sarah Guppy is a Melbourne legend. She's a publicist and marketing professional. She's the director of This Much Talent and a business development manager at Gig Life Pro. And finally, we have Lior Elbeck Ripka. Lior is the co founder of Artist and Events Agency Hear Them Holler and also the artistic director of the Festival of Jewish Arts and Music. So the five of us today are gonna to be exploring the differences and opportunities in old and new media and how to make the most of them. While I'm assuming that most of our audiences today will be within the arts, uh, within the music industry and possibly in particular the jazz industry, I think it would be pretty safe to say that the issues and points which we're discussing would apply to many disciplines across 
the creative industries. So let's get stuck into this. I think it's probably worthwhile, and guys, I'd be really keen to hear your thoughts on just defining a few terms. Um, new and old media um, tends to sort of get a little bit murky. But Michael, I might sort of spin to you first. Um, as a music journalist and someone with an incredibly accomplished career, did you want to, I personally hate the term old media. I think it sounds really like it's redundant and out of date, which it certainly is not. Michael, did you want to sort of give us a rundown of what you think is old or traditional media? Well, I suppose when people talk about old media, they're talking about newspapers, television and radio, really, um, in a nutshell. Um, and those things uh, still exist, obviously, and they coexist with new media, which is broadly speaking, digital, you know, everything from online zines and YouTube to the various social media platforms. So yeah, the perception is that old media is um, kind of on the downward curve and new media is coming up to take its place. The reality is that they coexist. <clears throat> um, we're talking, of course, at an extremely, at a particularly unpredictable phase of this journey. Uh, what COVID-19 has done has made, uh, has thrown all of the cards up in the air. So, I mean, I would have said something different about the likelihood of old media surviving probably three months ago than I would say now. But um, as a performer, as an artist, you kind of need to be aware of all of them and you need to, you know, you know use them all to the, you know, to the extent that they, you know, reach your audience, I suppose. Yeah, awesome. Um, I think it's really interesting in terms of what uh, COVID-19 has done for, you know, old media. If you look at things like The Leader or even just the eight cuts of the ABC, it sort of is becoming a very real thing. It's also an industry which has been extremely hit hard by COVID-19. Um, Paige, I'm going to divert to you on this one. What would you call as the new media as such? Um, yeah, I guess what Michael was saying new media is a lot of digital stuff, but I also completely agree to like go off your question. I agree that new and old media can coexist. And we've also seen that a lot of old media is not stuck in the way that technology was say in the nineties television right now, the technology behind it is not what it was in the nineties. You can now have targeted ads on broadcast TV, depending on your setup. Um, and same with radio, even though radio is, you know, technically old, old media um it has been integrated and you know you can also you know you have digital radio or you can stream stuff later um so it is integrated with new media but yeah i guess you know facebook instagram TikTok, um search blogs websites streaming that kind of thing it was a really long answer <laughs> right perfectly fine it's there's a lot there's a lot within new media i think it's yeah. um particularly sort of since the rise of web 2.0 where it's sort of become this two-way stream yeah. it's sort of become yeah. A really interesting um, world which is continually developing um, and it's really it's quite difficult to stay up to date with the developments. Um, Sarah and Leo, I just wanted to um, spin to you both for this as well. We sort of raised there that um, this idea of the old media of newspapers um, has become a little you know and I want to sort of move away from this idea that newspapers and old media has become redundant. How do you guys you know feel about you know, using the old media as such. Um, I'm happy to no. go. <laughs> I, I <laughs> Sorry. add to the new media quickly. There's also um, other platforms like Twitch as well, which has had a massive uprising during COVID. Um, they were focusing on music stuff at the end of last year, but obviously COVID hit this year and forced them to move a lot faster. That's like a huge, huge platform now for, for music. And also there's another platform that could be interesting and based as new media, but it's called Patreon, which is where you're connecting direct with your fan base. So that's another interesting one to look at. If you're a very personable artist and you know you want to connect direct with people. Um, but back to old media, I look for me, it's kind of hard. I actually agree they do coexist. And the reason that they are still important to me is it's it's real journalism. It's it's amazing people like Michael who um, are amazing writers and have been in the business for a long time and are very experienced. But also the old media still is great because if you want to get awards as a musician, say if you want to be 
you know, up for an AMP award or a Music Victoria award or Q Music awards, you know, all of the amazing music awards and accolades that you can get, all those journalists are the people behind those awards. So it's actually still really important to make sure you're servicing and keeping in contact with the old media. Leon, how yeah. do you feel about that? Yeah. I, um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I concur with much of what has already been said. Um, and I think they coexist. I think that to, you know, yeah, kind of dismiss old media as irrelevant and, um, um, you know, on par with new media is, is problematic because I think that um, whilst, you know, new media offers lots of new opportunities and you lose the gatekeeper. Um, there is trust implicit in the work that has already happened to establish these, you know, traditional older media outlets. There's a reason, you know, their taste, there's, there's a tastemaker aspect, there's a trust aspect, there's um, an authoritative aspect, which, you know, yeah, it's patriarchy to an extent, but it's, you know, and it's not as maybe democratising and socialist as the new media, but I, I think that, you know, um, yeah, you've got, it's Michael, you know, you've got Michael Dwyer, there are, there are people who've earned their stripes. They didn't, you know, they didn't just sort of get plonked as an influencer, like they're, they're the original, you know, influencers to a degree, not all of them, obviously, and, but yeah, I hope that answered it. Too. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's probably a really good point for today's session. It's not about putting new versus old. It's really about how artists can sort of use like a whole suite, you know, same as we use Instagram and Facebook and possibly Twitter or Twitch or Patreon or whatever. You know, it's about um, utilising those elements of all the media landscape, which we have to the best um, of, you know, what we can and to get the best results. We're going to move on to something which is a little bit of a bugbear for me. And I feel like Sarah will probably um, appreciate this as well. Um, I can't tell you the amount of times that I've been, you know, had phone calls from an artist or a band or a CEO or an artistic director or whoever that's come to me and said, why is this band not on the cover of Spectrum? Why is, the, you know, no one covering them? Why is this, you know, why isn't Michael Dwyer knocking down our door to write this article? Why aren't they on, you know, the project? Even though we sort of find it difficult to articulate what the story might be, they're saying they're a great artist, they're a great artist, they're a great musician, this album's really great. But it sort of requires a little bit more than that. Michael, I was wondering if you could sort of take us through, when you, when you know, as a, as a journalist, what are you looking for to write that article? Is it, just a re is it just a really good album or are they just a sick musician? Is that enough? No, sadly, of course it's not. You need to find the story and, you know, part of the, part of, you know, this is a kind of a problem with that big democratic field of new media, uh, which is that artist has album out, 3,000 word piece follows. Uh, often it's not very enlightening. Often it doesn't really have a story to tell. Uh, it's like just the act of like being an active musician means all of these suddenly this whole kind of armory of resources comes to your disposal and there you are you're part of the noise out there in the new media environment I think when you uh, you know in the world that I live in um, if I, I hear something I like but I gotta, I gotta work out what the story is what is interesting about this what's the artist saying what's new um, what can I convince an editor is going to be worth you know, worthy of, you know, her attention and more importantly, her reader's intention, uh, interest, I mean, attention. And that's something which, if it starts with the artist, that's great. If, and it really comes down to the core of what being an artist is, you know, I mean, sort of taking leaps and bounds here, but an artist needs to know their intention. They need to know what their story is. They know what it is that they're, what they're putting into the world. Um, you know, just being a great musician, I mean, I don't need to diminish that. That's a fantastic thing. But particularly in the jazz world, everywhere you look, uh, there are fantastic musicians. It's what story are they telling about us? What story are they telling about the world we live in? What have we not heard about before? Uh, and that's the hook that I'm always looking for to actually tell a story which is bigger than artist has album out, artist has gig. 
you know, I mean, sadly, Artist Aid's gig is the story of the century right now, um, would be the story of the century. But Artist does not have gig. Yeah, <laughs> Artist does not have gig. I mean, I, I have no written Artist has not have gig story four or five times, and that's enough. We, we, we know that story. What's the next story? So yeah. really, it is all about story. It's about the artists knowing what it is that they're doing in the world, the big picture. How am I different? What is my story? That's something that I want to dig deeper into and tell. And that's what we want to read as readers. Look, I'm opening a newspaper. How old media am I? <laughs> I think I asked I think... a question. Have you ever like listened to an artist and gone, this music is bloody fantastic. There is no story, but I just want to write about it because the music's so good. Yeah. There is never not a story okay. if the music is actually <laughs> that. But then I've got to, but I, I mean, don't you think? Yeah. Don't you think if the music is really, if, I mean, good, you know, there's got to be a story. Yeah. Let's see. So, Michael, you, you know what it is until you sit down. Do you, with can I ask a question? Please. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Is it, I mean, what, you know, you're talking about fine, because I think that fine, I was, when you said finding the story, I thought that is so pertinent in this conversation because that is part of new media, it's part of old media. When that, trying to get the artists to connect directly with their fans and then looking at the platforms and thinking, what am I beyond this song? What have I got? What, what, what can I talk about? What can I do? what, you know, what's my world? Like, that's what you, you know, as a manager as well, that's what we're trying to get the artists to think about to do because, yeah, there are a million bands out there. So what are your, you, you know, and to, to, to talk in, you know, marketing speak and, <laughs> and no artist wants to be talked about as a product and a brand, but, you know, what are your unique selling points? You know, what, what are your, um, and so I think that's part of the same thing, but I was going to ask you, Michael, like, you know, do you ever hear to, to, to on top of Paige's question of, do you ever just hear something and go, this is magic? And like, yeah, I haven't read anything about this, the artist and it's just, you know, and then you go, I'm going to find the story. But they, they, you know, that it's a, that it's a reverse. Of, of course you do. But the problem yeah. with that, I mean, as we, we all know, how many, um, uh, you know, it used to be CDs, you know, like 10, 10, 15 years ago, I'd go to the mailbox every day. I had a monster mailbox built in this house that I live in now because I used to get <laughs> piles of CDs, hundreds of CDs a week. Now that is just like too mind blowing. And all, you can't listen to them all that physically aren't, there aren't enough hours in your life to listen to all the product coming out. Well, that's multiplied. And now it's in your inbox every day. Bing, mm. bing, 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 bing whole album, streams and streams and streams of them. And without even that advantage of a, you know, like a, a, an image, a, a really carefully thought out image on the cover that gives you some insight into the, it's just a line, it's just a subject line. So it's harder and harder for me to decide what I'm gonna listen to. And then when I do listen to it, sadly, I know I have fewer and fewer and fewer options for who I can pitch this story to yeah. because old media is disappearing and the new media on the other hand is just an absolutely awash with ever with everything and no gatekeepers and no sense of distinction or uh so i mean yes the answer to your question yeah that happens i'll hear something and go wow this is fantastic who can i pitch this to who's gonna who's, who's gonna say to me yes i have space that week to run this story and I think that question is the hardest one for me right now. That's also a really good point. We've sort of mentioned this word twice, and that's probably where I want to move into as well, is this idea of a gatekeeper. Um, and Michael, we're sort of speaking, you know, the focus is on you at the moment. But, you know, you obviously as a journalist have your own, you know, because also, funnily enough, as a journalist, you're also a person with your own musical tastes and, you know, your likes and your dislikes and the things that will get your attention same as when we go with an editor, same as when we go with something else. This idea that there is a gatekeeper and it is, you know, it's, you know, media theory again, which can be a little bit daunting, but without sort of putting too much on it, it's also that once you give that to that gatekeeper as an, um, as a sort of an outlet or an influencer as such, which is probably a bit more of a modern take on things, you lose control of the message. So, you know, you can put it out there and they can say, yes, this is great, I love it. But there's also a risk that they can say, I hate it, don't listen to this album, which is sort of the, the risk that you take with a free media. Um, 
but you know the new media does put you know it removes that gatekeeper as as such and puts us you know or artists or managers in control of the message and what we want to put onto the world is there anything that we should you know and this is sort of for everyone Paige I'd love to sort of hear your thoughts yeah. maybe to start with what we should consider when we're using the new media to ensure that we are having maximum effect with yeah. putting the messages out there yeah I think so I have I have kind of like two opinions of this whole idea of the gatekeeper and I also hate the word gatekeeper I, I like the, I also very much appreciate like really beautifully curated record labels and journalists do incredible work as curators and maybe more just like, you know, I'll follow a music journalist because I know they have fantastic taste in music, but the idea of an actual gatekeeper who's kind of like, yes, no, I'm not into, and I feel like, and this is not getting controversial, like for the whole Black Lives Matter <laughs> issue and music and Black culture, for instance, I know a lot of people were saying like, oh, as a as a gatekeeper of culture, I need to, you know, help black voices being heard. But that's where I start being like, well, I almost feel like it gets into a, like a weird spot when select people are acting as gatekeepers. And that's why I think new media is really important because it kind of puts a bit more power into artists and audiences. And so artists aren't relying on like 1% of the population to be like, I like you, or I don't like you. And they can find their own audiences because curators are wonderful and I definitely follow a few music journalists who I'm like they have fantastic taste in music but at the same time you know there's so many genres and so many niche audiences and like jazz for instance is one that's not a super mainstream it's not a super mainstream genre of music so say if you are you know have a very specific niche in jazz you might not find that many you know radio stations or journalists covering your type of music so I kind of think there's a place for both of them and I like how new media kind of gives every artist the opportunity to, to find their potential audience out there in the world. Um, yeah. <laughs> Was your question around maximum impact? Yeah, I think I'd be so keen, and I, we're going to get into communities and building followings yeah. and all those sorts of things as well. You yeah. obviously work in, you know, what I, some of us call the dark arts of the new media. In terms <laughs> of, it is know, a dark art, yeah. We to ASOS and we get <laughs> one t-shirt and then all of a sudden it follows, yeah. us, follows us forever until we finally... Yeah payment and buy the bloody thing yeah um you know you sort of work within that area and do amazing yeah. work in that yeah when we're sort of using new media what is you know if you could just give like without going too far into some of the technical aspects of things yeah. as an emerging artist or as an artist who's got maybe a twitter account facebook a few different platforms what would yeah. you sort of say um should be your main consideration when using new media i think the the awesome thing about new media is that it's a two-way conversation with your fans and so I think there's a huge opportunity like say if you you know your band gets an interview on a blog which I still love I used to have a blog there's not really that two-way communication versus if you you know have an Instagram page and people are writing to you on it or you have a Twitch for instance um, like Sarah mentioned and your audience are donating money to you and chatting to you you should really use that opportunity to interact with your fans and a lot of like, you know, the whole thing about what Michael was saying, but there's always a story. The same thing applies with audiences. It's not just artists to journalists, but it's also artists to audiences. I would, um, you know, like Louis Capaldi, not a jazz artist at all, but he has a really beautiful relationship with his audience because they talk and there's a lot of memes and conversations going on. And so the best, the best artists use new media to build really deep relationships and their fans will not only fall in love with the music, maybe the music's just the hook, but they fall in love with the person and that's what they really fall behind and become a career lifelong fan. So I think definitely leverage that and leverage data. Yeah, data's a really interesting one. And I feel like that's probably a whole other <laughs> area to go into. If we're sort of sticking with that, um, ensuring we're getting maximum impact. Sarah, did you want to add anything on that where you've sort of seen really good examples of artists using new media? Um, I guess there's, um, look for me, and this was touched upon before, it comes back to, and I hate to say this, and musicians are going to hate me saying this, but you are your brand. Like, you oh, are that brand. Be said. <laughs> You are the CEO of your company. It is your business. Like, unfortunately, I hate to say it, but it's true. Um, like, we are the brands of our businesses, you know, um, and, and that's, that's how it works. And I always say to artists, you know, oh. Tell me more about who you are. What is what is the message that you want to get across? What is your story? What is it that you want to tell the world? Because it's true. As you said, Paige, people fall in love with you as a person and you love a musician because you want to be their best friend or you want to be them 
or you want to be there. <laughs> no, and for me personally, I connect a lot with lyrics as well of songs. Um, but and Michael, you know, this can probably go back to you. Like for me, I'm really particular about press shots and things as well because, like you said, you're getting a hundred emails you know per hour probably into your inbox and when you're clicking on stuff you're looking you know usually the first thing you see is an image which is your brand so you kind of you have to make sure you get that right and are there times michael where you kind of look at something and just kind of dismiss it because the image doesn't look right to you yeah yeah well more more often well more often i'll dismiss something because it's just a solid block of text uh <laughs> you know but, but those sort of um, you know, kind of ideals of presentation have been around forever, how your press release looks and stuff. But the old media press release and, you know, the way you introduce yourself to someone, which was kind of two pages of top copy with a staple in the top left corner, which, you know, came wrapped around the CD, that you, you, can't, you can't translate that into email world. Yeah, you need to click on that email and you need to see a fantastic image and four lines. I mean, you need to think like, a you know a, a sub editor a, a layout artist a, a, a you know a, a newspaper editor you need to think about what those things that are going to set off little fireworks in the reader's head immediately you <laughs> need to know what they are and yeah sure headline photo keywords all that sort of stuff and these are kind of things which Sarah I'm sure you, you know, you would not, I mean, you know, th those of us who work with artists know artists aren't really geared to thinking about that sort of stuff. They shouldn't, you know, in a sense, they shouldn't have to. They, they've got deeper things to be thinking about. Or, um, But yeah, if they are going to take it into their own hands and be their own publicist and talk to their own audience and bypass old media and jump straight into this kind of, you know, as I say, this torrent, this nonstop torrent, they need a few key old media skills, uh, keywords, headlines, photos, so they, so they really present who they are instantly in the email, in the, you know, whatever it is, MailChimp. Good. And a a good on. example on that. Sorry, just one, one quick example on that. We, when I was at Jazz Festival last year, had a, I'm not gonna say any names, but I'll probably be obvious as I can be, um, an elder of the jazz, um, sector absolute legend might have turned 80 this year we got it we managed to uh or last year we uh, managed to secure a cover of spectrum for the for an article last year because they're an absolute legend it's a really big cue that coup that we got them to come to the festival and the images which we had were from the late 70s and um Lindy from spectrum was just like no we're not going to run that we're not going to run that and because it, it's just not a good enough image it had zero impact the fact that this person was probably the biggest name in jazz forever um and they it, it was just quite simple they're like we're just not going to run this story you know, you're going to miss out on the cover unless you can get us a better image um and that's happened probably two or three times i can remember and it all comes out it doesn't matter who you are as an artist if your image sucks it sucks you're not going to get you're not going to get the cover and you yeah. that's the thing that you work so hard for don't mm -hmm. let your images you know fall you down I've, I've had that a few times and it's so disappointing to have to go back and be like but you know the yeah. thing just isn't right or we don't have the right image but just to go back quickly to your question before dean about um an example of someone that's done something well um there's actually this artist in, um based out of singapore called Meisha one um not jazz but she works in a in a genre of music that again isn't mainstream she does a lot of a uh, dub kind of music She's built her brand perfectly and goes back to who she is um, and has used new media very well, like with her Instagram stuff. But she created a, um, like a source. Um, I think it's like a, oh, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. I'll, I'll send everyone a link. But she created a source and within that source, like when you open her lid, she's put like um, a playlist that you can do for cooking, like when you're cooking with her sauce of her tracks and stuff like that. <laughs> and now like when it went into COVID, she sold out of her sauce. <laughs> yeah. And literally people were contacting her to market their brands, like, you know, their food brands <laughs> and things like that. There you go. That's <laughs> a contextual, contextual listening to like the next level. <laughs> I mm. think that the note about having the correct image isn't just an old media thing as well. It's also a new mm. media thing. I've heard of artists um, miss out on opportunities for Spotify and Apple 
editorial like homepage listing because they won't provide a better image. And Apple's like, we know the data and we know this photo won't work. Um, yeah. And they've also done like Facebook do these really hectic um, studies with, you know, like, yeah, statistical maths kind of studies that show the impact of the different elements of a Facebook ad, for instance, in terms of making someone purchase a ticket to an event or buy an album. And I think the, the, you know, the copy, they separated it by like copy, the Facebook page it's coming from, um, landing page, what else is it? Like targeting and the creative. And I can't remember the exact stat, but it's something like 60% of the entire purchase decision is from that photo. And so it's so important. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think um, it's, it's such a hard conversation to have with artists. I mean, you know, this is, this is, this is stuff that you need to think about whatever business you're in, right. You know, um, cutting through the noise, but it, it goes contrary to so, so much, you know, of, uh, about what's intrinsic to an artist's, you know, way of being, which is this, or this kind of, and, and so it's, I think like, you know, being in the music industry, I feel like sometimes my job is to like to try to, you know, you know, the artist is just like, but I love this photo and kind of, you know, <laughs> fuck this. Can I say that? You know, <laughs> you know that, that, you know, they're going, but this is me. And it's so it's like, yeah, and you don't, you don't want to start moving into the conversation of doing anything that isn't you, you know, because when you start going, but you know, this is what Apple wants. It's like yeah. they, they turn into, you know, different kind of gatekeepers, right? Yeah, exactly. different kind of system that they're trying to rail against, um, you know, and, you know, even in terms of Black Lives Matter, it's like, who are they, who are those people making those decisions? And then, you know, do we, you know, an artist might also be like, well, I want to change the fact that people need me to look beautiful to purchase the image or I've got a certain colour skin or, you know, whatever the kind of what beauty looks like. Or So I think it's really hard to find that place where it's like, can we find something that feels right and feels authentic, but will look good in this space? Yeah. yeah. On this channel, you know? Which is, yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think part of it, this is probably a good, can, good point to sort of move into the next thing. And I think it's probably part of, if you want to stay true to yourself, you've got to find that community. You've got to find that, you know, the tribe or whoever you are, like you've got to find your following that if this is what you want to put out into the world and this is who you are, you've got to find your following. Um, so, and new media is a really great way of building your community and building a following and keeping them up to date with what's going on in your world. Um, so Lou, I'm going to spin to you on this one. What are some of the ways that we can build these communities or things that you have um, been done or what do you need to be thinking about when building a community, building an online community? I'm specifically referring to that online community, that online following. Maybe that's something you can take us through. You know, we had a brief chat yesterday about the Jewish, uh, the Festival of Jewish Arts and Music that you sort of took it on and you had to sort of build this new online following. Yeah, so we um, took over an existing Jewish music festival um, that, you know, 85% of the audiences were over 55. Um, they would have had a really big focus on old media. Um, that's also where a lot of their audiences were consuming media and information. Um, and we took it over. And one of the things that was really important was for us um, in bringing in new audiences. And so we have slowly been trying to and not slow because we want to, slow because it's really hard. Um, mm -hmm. Been trying to find our audiences online, um, and that you know, and it and it's it's hard, and it is more fragmented, and um, you know. But in the last three months, we actually used this opportunity. We were we put on a festival last year, and then this year we have um, we announced we were going to do monthly online events and. For our first, and our series is called Homeward Bound. And for our first event, we did a panel conversation about unorthodox, and we doubled our audiences that we had had in at the festival in the year prior. We had, you know, two thousand seven hundred um, people register for the event, which was huge. And we had thirty percent who were outside the Jewish community, and forty-five percent of the audiences were under fifty-five. So 
I mean, I, I'm not saying I know what I'm, you know, I know what the answer is and it's easy. You know, I think that event tapped into a lot of things, including the fact that unorthodox, you know, was huge on Netflix and we got it at the author at the right time um, and managed to kind of tap into both a Jewish interest story and a more mainstream story. But, um, you know, I, it, it's hard and I don't, and I also, you know, I think it's, you can do one thing and go, oh, okay, you know, we doubled our subscribers, we've doubled our Instagram, um, we've got more people following us on Facebook, but they, are they going to stay with us? You know, how, who, who are they? Do they want to know everything that, that we're doing or are they just interested in that? Were they only interested in unorthodox? Um, you know, and then how do you navigate maintaining your existing audiences and then building new ones? And, I, you know, I think, I guess the advantage of new media and that, that, two-way relationship that Paige is talking about is the, the difference is the thing that old media can't do in the way that new media can is that we can listen and we can engage. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can talk to your audiences directly without um, someone monitoring that and, and hear what they want and, and, and look for, and look at what's happening around and say, oh, okay, those people are interested in that. So, I don't know if that answers. Absolutely, it does. I think there's also a, there's a real power there, which I think we really need to tap into and really listening to what audiences are saying. It's the greatest tool for, you know, like no artist or no, you know, many arts organisations can't afford to do any form of in-depth market research other than a survey, which we send out via email. But you've got these amazing tools at your disposal, whether like it's just, it's literally your Instagram account, it's your Facebook account, it's whatever, that you can actually listen to what your audiences are saying you know like it is about trial and error if you know we spend often we spend so much time fretting about doing you know one instagram post and i've worked at places where you know there'd be a two-hour discussion about a tile like this because maybe that's not quite right and maybe, maybe we need to use this word maybe we need to use that word at the end of the day it doesn't freaking matter like just try it and see you know yeah. like yeah because guess what if it doesn't work you can delete it i'm not saying you know, that these things don't exist, but it's about trial and error. And the thing is, you know, Michael, I'm sure that you would probably, you know, be envious of that, you know, or the newspapers would be envious of that, that once the newspaper is printed, that's it, that exists. You know, the idea of this two way that you can change it and you can listen and you can pivot as such, pivot is like, you know, the word of 2020, you can sort of use these areas to go into different areas. Um, yeah. Do anyone else want to have anything more to say on that? I was going to also say in terms of um, what Leo was saying about listening and engaging and like that two-way street, it's so important. And a really handy thing about it as well is that you can also involve the, I mean, I'm sure some artists will hate this, but you can involve your audience in actual content creation. Not necessarily saying like, you know, get them in as like a producer, but it's cool because along the way you can share stuff with them and be like, what do you think? Or... I know artists like say Fluma Grimes, for instance, will put stems up so that their audience can make remixes. Um, I've also worked on some campaigns um, where, you know, we've done things like Instagram polls or DM and ask the audience, the actual fans to tell us like, what do you want to see more of? What do you want our, um, you know, our encore to be? Or if we remix something, what would you want to do? And on top of just being really good market research, I think giving giving fans that like ownership over a creative project really makes them fall in love with you more. It gets that buy-in from the audience. And they, I've seen, especially with small to medium artists that do this, the audience feel like they're part of a community and they feel really involved. And because of that, they will like really stand behind the artists and like really champion them, which is incredible. There's a really good example of that actually within the jazz world yep. of everyone's favorite late night band at MIJF, The Rookies. Um, the Rookies have done a gig at the Rooks Return for the past three years. Obviously, that's not a possible at the moment. Um, they're also, they were, you know, the house band for Late Night Jams for the past two years. Um, and every night that they, every gig they finish, um, they play Sunny Side of the Street. And it's all really fun and great. And actually what they did is they sent out the stems to their audiences online when they were doing their gigs. Because um, they did lots of, they were still doing their Wednesday night residency via Zoom. And they actually created a really great video where everyone was singing Sunny Side of the Street. So if you want to see a really good example of that, check out the rookies on Facebook or Instagram or they've got a Patreon. Go and join up to their Patreon. 
Um, that's a really good example of how they've been able to use their audience to um, bring that in. I also saw um, on Instagram, Sampa the Great did um, a cute little, um, you know, she did some little video of her like make setting up her, her a room um, while one of her tracks was playing. Um, and it was kind of, I think it was going in, you know, what's it called? Fast. Like sped up. Sped up. Yeah. And then she was like, you know, it, it was during this time. So it was like about kind of making a video clip at home with just whatever you've got. And she said to people like, you know, send me a clip of you doing this at home to the same track. Um, and I think it was, she, I, I can't remember, but she might've said like, I'm going to use, I'm going to put it all together for a video clip. Um, which I thought was really cool because it was also just like, you know, use your iPhone, use your room, like, you know, and it was a conversation that she was bring, yeah, bringing her audience in. Um, yeah. And now when that comes out with people's footage, they're going to share that. They're going to share that, oh, right. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, I was just part of a, uh, the Ice Cream Hands did a video, um, uh, no, no Weapon But Love, fantastic song, and it's got a really kind of inclusive feeling, and they put a call out you know, if, here's the song, here are the chords, if you want to play along and mime, we'll put it all together. They did a beautiful video. Uh, if you look closely, you might find me in there somewhere. <laughs> See, you're doing but, it now. <laughs> what's that? You're, you're now doing the thing of sharing it because you're part of it. Well, that's, that's my point is that, you know, <laughs> every person who was involved in that, wow, you know. So that is a really practical way of multiplying, you know, the way that Facebook videos work, the way you know, social media videos work is shares multiply your viewers like kind of exponentially over a period of time. So it's, it's kind of, I mean, on that level, it almost sounds cynical, but, it, but it's a beautiful video. It feels really inclusive and fun. And uh, it's, I think, been pretty, a lot more effective than if it was just the band, you know, performing alone in their studio. I've got to, I'm going to, we're going to move on to another question, which I think is a really, it's, I'm going to say it's not controversial, but it may be controversial for some people. Um, so since the arrival of what we're going to call as Auntie, Auntie Rona, um, we're seeing a lot of performances and gigs go online and we feel like that's sort of the default that a lot of people have just, you know, said, okay, we'll set up a camera and we'll just perform online and we'll do it via Facebook Live or, you know, Zoom or wherever. I'd love to know your thoughts. You know, I've got, I feel like I've got some thoughts on this, um, but I'd love to know each of your thoughts on, you know, what are your thoughts on doing this and the longevity of it? When we're particularly looking at it for the longevity of the industry, knowing that at some stage soon, some stage, hopefully, we don't know when it will be, but hopefully, you know, there is going to be an industry afterwards. What are our thoughts on just taking gigs and putting them online? What's, you know, I'd love to know people's thoughts on that. I have a very strong opinion on this and I really Please. dislike it. <laughs> um, I've been from the start, like, do not play these shows for free. Yeah. It's going back to remember when CDs came in or um, Napster came about and started taking people's music for free. It's the same thing. Artists need to not accept doing gigs for free. I think for me personally, I've recommended all of my artists to not do it. Um, unless they're getting paid or unless it's a publication or a radio station that they would have normally done that with. So if you were to say do a live to air on Triple R, which obviously they can't do right now, um, then I'm all for it because it's that audience who would have been doing it anyway. But I, I'm, I personally find it really hard to connect with these shows online as well. Like watching someone in their bedroom on Instagram, it's just not just doesn't work for me. I know that there's a lot of people connecting with it and it is a sense of community for some people. Like I know that people, you know, are chatting with each other in the, in the chat things and stuff like that. So I do understand it, but I don't think artists should go down that route of playing for free. There's actually a um, huge wave of what passes, I'm sorry to interrupt, like a huge uh, kind of spectrum of what passes for live streaming gigs. Uh, you know, on, on the one hand, you have those kind of, uh, Instagram marathon gigs where people play for 10 minutes uh, and, and it's all about community, all about connection. And it's really, I mean, it's quite lovely on that level. Um, but yeah, as you say, at the end of the, the 10 minutes, well, that's it. You've, you've had a bit of fun, but you, you still don't know where your next meal is coming from. Mm -hmm. And then all the way through to, you know, 
big uh, things like, you know, we've seen a series of delivered live that Henry Wagons presented and uh, memo live, you know, which, and that's all about high production values and like real performance. I've seen some pretty good ones. I mean, the Black Zorro's, Kate Sobrano did a fantastic one at Memo Theatre and, you know, because she's such a, um, you know, sort of an old school kind of done a lot of television variety shows, she really knew how to connect with the camera. And that was, I mean, I found that quite involving actually. Um, but, you know, the, the, these are, at that end of the spectrum, uh, people have to pay, you've got to pay. And it's not much, I mean, I think it was 10 or 15 bucks for Kate. Um, but that builds up, you know, considering we're talking about an international audience here, uh, the payday was probably pretty good. Um, and I've heard, you know, anecdotally musicians telling me, you know, I'm killing it in the live streaming world because I'm getting fans from Germany and Seattle or whatever, you know, throwing a hundred bucks at me. Uh, that's great, but two things about it. It's not a gig. No one feels it's really a gig. They see it as kind of a intermediate stage where, okay, this is better than nothing. Uh, but um, the other thing is the, your fans in Seattle and Germany don't want to see you do the same thing every week. You know, the, the whole, this whole, you know, live performance is all about moving on to a new audience night after night and having a new experience, um, not presenting the same thing over and over again. So much as we'd love this to be uh, a solution, uh, it's really kind of, um, I think, operating to a great extent on goodwill and a genuine enthusiasm for everybody to keep things happening. I don't, it, it's not live performance. It, it, it's not the same thing as being in a room with a bunch of people who are having the same experience at the same time. Mm. Can, can I, but... can I um, add, add to that? I think that a few things um, that yeah, touch on my, what Michael and Sarah were saying as well. I think there's an issue with um, people, audiences, are they paying and are the, are the artists being paid? There's that part of it as well um, because, you know, Sarah's saying like, you know, don't, don't do it for free unless it would have been something you did for free six months ago because it was a PR outlet and I totally agree with that. Um, mentality and you know we, we at FOJAM we have been doing these artist to artist chats on a Friday where they also two artists sing a song or talk about a Jewish artist that inspires them and we initially were like do we do we offer money how you know what how do we feel about this and we came to the decision that we were going to pay all our artists to do it um, and we feel really good about that. Um, there's still, you know, and, and for the reasons Sarah talked about as well, that especially now, you know, it's like, well, um, if we want to actually help to keep the industry going, we need to pay artists. And it's just this, it's such a bad cycle to get into where we increasingly are relying on these, uh, on the arts industry to just like, you know, make us feel better for no money. So the other part of that is that there's still a problem, you know, obviously when, you know, no one's paying for Instagram, but Facebook Live, you can now pay. But it's still about, we're still giving our audiences all our programming for free, yeah. right? We've got to donate if you want to and can, but it's free for you. And I still, it's still problematic because what we're saying is, you know, and, and everybody's doing, not everybody. I mean, Mimo, you paid, you had to pay $10 and it's great. And I think, um, what's his name? <laughs> Byron Bay, folky, acoustic, dreadlocks, maybe. Oh. Anyway, he is. There's an artist, an Australian artist. Like Ash Bridgewater or something? Yeah. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> I was thinking. Um, Rate like making heaps of money independently, doing his thing, connecting with his artists, and charging. Um, I don't know. If, I don't know if it's a donation situation, but, but I think I do think there's this training that we have to do in the industry of saying to people like, "Who is paying? You can't expect yeah. to keep getting this content for free." I think it's what you were saying, Sarah, about Napster, and just like you know, we're all outraged about you know how little artists get on Spotify, but this is how things start that we all accept it as just like, yep, we're just getting it all for free content for free. 
you know, and then we're all, you know, everyone's outraged when you've got to pay $5 or whatever it is. But, I, you know, how do you, how do, you do that um, when it's just, there are so many channels that, and I guess it's a Patreon like situation maybe, yeah. or it's Facebook's doing it or yeah. Leo, can I ask, cause you said that you're, you've set it up as a donation. Can I ask what's yeah. the percentage of people that are attending donating? Yeah. So that's interesting. And I think that about, I'm going to, I want to say between 25 and 35% of people are donating. However, it ended up working out to be about like maybe $5, like if you broke it down to the number of people that came. So it sort of said to us, all right, well, people maybe, you know, it's like people would pay five bucks. Um, but in this time where we're trying to expand our audiences and, you know, and, and a lot of people have been financially hit, you know, terribly and everybody's giving content for free. So to kind of be a small organization that's like, we're going to charge, you know, I, we weren't going to do that, but, but I, I don't, I don't think it comes without the problems of, of every you know, we're all sort of going, well, oh, we're not going to charge. No one's charging, you know, yeah. and everyone gets used to getting this. It's yeah. such a fine I think that's where the, the really dangerous precedent comes in is we're giving away this content for free, which we've always said is a really bad thing. I will yeah. just sort of say at this point, and I think it's worthwhile saying where we are and what's happening is that MIJF is paying their artists to do these, to do these <laughs> things happening all day today. Check it out, marvinjazz.com. Um, you know, they are paying their artists. But I think it's really important that we need to understand that audiences are getting this content for free. So for something like the Jazz Festival or the Festival of Jewish Arts and Music, you've got these audiences who in 2020, if they were going to attend the festival, they'd be spending 30 40 $50 a ticket, yeah. you know, something, you know, a lot more than that. Um, plus, they'd be buying a drink at home. Okay, yeah, they'll buy a bottle of wine, but they'll be paying for a taxi or an Uber or parking or something like that. So that's... I feel like we're probably a little bit too timid sometimes um, in the music industry that we prepare ourselves. And I think we've probably built a rod for our own back that we've given away our content for free, probably too much for too long. Um, we see it and there's amazing times, you know, look what we did with the bushfires where we raised all the money. It was the art sector that were doing all these sorts of things. I'm not saying don't ever do that. Those things will still be, you know, but we've got to look after ourselves as well. So, but you've got to message it right. And I think, Leo, that's what you're saying about the donations. Say, hey, you were going to come to FoJam. You probably would have spent $10 on parking. You probably would have spent $20 on parking. You probably would have spent $30 to see this gig. How about chucking us a bone and giving us, you know, that $30 that you would have spent already? Don't give us, you know, we understand it's not the same as a normal gig. You know, don't give us the full price of a $50 ticket. But if you just gave us half or just five bucks will do because it's five bucks we didn't have yesterday so i think that's the thing about it not being it's like not a real gig and i think that's something that a lot of artists mm. are not understanding mm. right now and i feel like it's never going to replace being in a real gig because that's like a social event you're hanging up lots of people you're your your drink, you're there for the vibe and the ambience and you're there for like a lineup that's been curated and i think I agree with everything that's been said i think live streams are overrated they have their place but it is devaluing music um, but I think artists should use this opportunity and the technology, maybe instead of live streaming gigs, they should use this as an opportunity for building brands. And I've told a lot of our festival clients that like, you can't sell a festival ticket right now, but you've got a really captive audience. There's this thing right now called an attention surplus where people aren't going out. So they were all this time to like, just be on the internet. Internet usage has just gone through the roof and artists should use that to go, cool, I'm going to use this attention surplus to, really deepen my relationship with my fans right now. And maybe my live stream isn't the whole band together, probably because I keep seeing all these bands who live in different houses doing ISO gigs together from someone's bedroom. Like that's definitely not right. Um, but instead of doing that, doing like stripped back performances of like, they'll just do two songs and it's only acoustic or they'll do two songs and it's reimagined or without certain band members um, and doing it that kind of way to kind of really build your brand. You're not devaluing your music, but you might instead use this as an opportunity to sell future gigs by, you know, reaching new audiences that can't see you. It's like what I think Michael was saying before, you know, if, you, if you're doing a live stream performance of some sort, you can reach anyone in the world. It's not like 
I'm a Melbourne artist. I can only play a show to Melbourne artists. Now it's like, cool, we can use this and it's not replacing our Melbourne gig, but it's a really interesting marketing tool for when we're out of this pandemic to reach fans in Sydney and Brisbane, for instance. And maybe we do an Instagram co-hosting session with like a Sydney artist who has a fan base there and we can cross pollinate our fans instead. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think, yeah. yeah, I was, I think that's such a great point that I'm happy you raised because it is, you know, rather than throwing the baby out with the bathwater and <laughs> saying like, this is so hard this time. And you know, it's like, this is, you know, these aren't real gigs and it's like, who wants to watch it, which is all true as well. But at the same time, that those channels are going to exist when we get out of this. And you're still going to have to market your gigs. And yeah. how much better if you're, you know, I mean, Tash Sultana grew her following online. So it's possible. And you can, you can use this time and this, these media you know, and different mediums to, to, to build audiences and to, to get your chops up. Mm. Um, Absolutely. In your own in your own way of communicating and and you know getting, you know make video clips or whatever it is, it's like you you can yeah. you can really get yeah. better at it because it's not going to go away. You you're still going to have to come back to this. You know, it could be like for a jazz musician, it might be you know using a live stream, but it's a tour of your studio space, or it's like yeah. you're an incredible um, you know do a 30 minute Zoom class on like how to do piano improv for jazz and use that to deepen your relationship with different segments of your audience. Um, yeah. Hey, we've only got just a few minutes and there's a couple of, there's, we've had a sort of couple of questions come through, but I really do want to um, lean on all of your experience. Um, we've got, you know, thank you for joining us. You've had, you've had such a great conversation. We are living in these crazy, crazy times. Aunty Rona is like that nuts aunt, which has just come through at Christmas and just flipped up the table of, you know, Christmas dinner and everything's all over the place. But, you know, we do need to stay positive and we do need to remember that at some stage we're going to get back to the pubs and the clubs and the jazz clubs and all those sorts of things and we do need to stay resilient. What advice would you give to you know, any of our jazz musicians, any of our creative practitioners, anyone who's sort of really feeling this pinch of this crazy, crazy COVID times, what advice would you give, you know, as such? I think... Would that be about money or time yeah. or artists or whatever? <laughs> I think it's... I, this might sound really weird because I am a strategist and my whole job is around, like, making strategic frameworks and plans and that kind of thing. But I think a lot of artists just need to... A lot of people just need to chill out and calm down. I think a lot of people are completely panicking and it is really valid but I think chill out and just don't worry about what plan of attack don't try to find a one two three this is exactly what you need to do and I think just be genuine and authentic take care of your audiences and I think that authenticity will really shine through and it's good advice going forward but yeah just build beautiful communities and use this as an opportunity to deepen that yeah I would say the same find find that community get involved in those communities um through gig life we've been hosting um zoom calls every week with like 15 to 20 people all around the world just so people can keep connecting with each other and i know that a lot of people are doing it you're doing it leo so find those communities they will exist in the jazz world and you know keep communicating with each other and it's you know even if it does turn into a bit of a counseling session then that's what we all need you know what it's a hard time you know, even for yeah. people who are still busy, it's still a really, really hard time because part of that you feel guilty about still having a job, still being able to work and still existing when other people's worlds are falling apart. So, you know, be kind to yourself and, and find that community. We are, Michael? Uh, I would say um, imagine a world <laughs> uh, which doesn't go back to normal. Uh, you know, I mean, there's this kind of, you know, uh, Dean, we all want to believe that narrative about don't worry, uh, you know, we'll get back to having regular gigs again. Uh, this is just a time we're going through. Um, imagine that, that wasn't the case. You know, I mean, I can't, you know, really, uh, maybe that's over. And it's, it's interesting if you look at it that way, because when you do, you see how... Uh, wrong in a way that the way that we um, make and sell music has gone and maybe this is time for a new start 
And I don't know what the innovations are. If I did, I would be making them right now. I'd be making a fortune and I would be the new gatekeeper and all, you know, what <laughs> the whole new landscape is, is unknowable. And, uh, you know, gigs, um, I, I wrote an article in the age today, get it from your news agent or subscribe. <laughs> and uh, it's about uh, how what is really gonna help live music is innovation small yeah. gigs in unusual places uh, paid for by fans that is a uh, logical future if everything we've been saying is comes true where the connections with our communities are the most important thing and the, uh, the gatekeepers of old are losing their power or whatever or, or are no longer relevant let's look at that future as a genuinely better one and think innovatively about how we can make it feasible. I love that, Michael. And Leo, I'm going, I'm going to come to you. I really love that point and I think it's really, really important. Um, I know I did say, you know, the gigs will return at some stage, but we just don't know and we don't know when it's going to be. We also know that this social distancing is going to be around for a long time. So unfortunately, small, small venues where we're not going to be able to fit people in, it's going to be really difficult to even imagine that gigs are going to go back to what they were like. But also, let's not be too nostalgic about what life was like prior to COVID. <laughs> you know, we were all working our asses off for, you know, I think we can say this in the music industry, for piss all money. Like, we were, we were really, really working quite hard for not a great deal of money. So let's actually use this as an opportunity to imagine this new world and sort of, yes, it's a tough time, but also let's be bold. Let's try something. Let's, you know, we've got nothing to lose because at the moment we've kind of don't, if, we've, if we have got gigs, absolutely, you know, all power to you. But there's a lot of people who don't have gigs and they're not making money from their art. You know, I started my own business at the start of the year and I basically lost all my clients. So if anyone wants to chat, please <laughs> let me know. What's <laughs> your business? I'm serving. Um, Lior, what advice would you I well, I, I was going to say a combination of things. I think, you know, and I, I'm telling myself this advice. So I'm, no, I'm not, you know, being like, I know what you should do. But, you know, I, if, if we're talking to artists, then I would say, you know, do what you do. Make, make your art, you know, and, and take this absolutely unknown to, to everybody who's alive now. You know, my grandfather's 90 and he's never experienced this and he's been through, you know, uh, World War II and been through a lot. Um, that this is, this is a unique opportunity to, to work on you, you know, you're probably not making much money before anyway. So, you know, um, you've got, you might, you know, if, if you hate gigging, great, then, then write. Um, and listen and and read and, and engage with what's happening or not, or just sit outside and look at the leaves. But whatever it is, I'm, I'm like, make your art and, and find your audiences and, and, and that might lead to innovation, whether that's you, you know, write an incredible piece of music or you find your community or, um, yeah. Or you do a gig in the street and, like, everybody's standing on their balconies and listening to you. Love it. Yeah. All really, really great advice. Um, I think, you know, I would just say be kind to each other, love each other, reach out to each other. Exactly as Sarah said, please, if anyone wants to chat, get in contact with the Jazz Festival and I'm more than happy to call. Sorry, I've got a cat about to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's done so well. Um, you know, be kind to each other, you know, pet your cat, go, Rick, go for a walk, read. Um, but also just be bold and try something, you know, go and stand in Edinburgh Gardens and play your trumpet and saxophone. Someone might give you five bucks, like, great. <laughs> um, but also, and that's really you know, old school. And that's, that's, that's really not, a, it's got not, you know, it's not, you don't need a screen, you know? No. I mean, that what, what they did in Italy is just, beautiful so beautiful so communal so much about you know there was i think that that first few weeks when we were in lockdown i just i was so touched walking around my streets where i don't really know my neighbors you know at all and people were painting in the front garden and i just you know to go on what you said michael about what can we what can what can we change for the better that that comes out of this and 
you know, and there's so much of new media. It is this, it's on the screen all the time. We're just like this, you know, da, 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 da. Um, I think trying to think about, we all are going, let's go to the jazz clubs because that's where we were together again and maybe off our phones. But if there are, if there are different ways of, of doing that um, as well, yeah. Yeah, I think try it all, try it new media, try it old media, yeah. try, it, try it everything. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. I hope um, that the audiences or whoever's listening um, has really taken away something um, if you did like it, please, you know, again, share it on, share it on YouTube, share it, share it with your friends. Um, but yeah, thank you. And also thank you to the Jazz Festival for investing um, in doing these sorts of things. I think it is really important to keep having these conversations, keep empowering artists, keep empowering the creative industries. We know what our value is, um, even if at times we're not as fun, we're not funded as well as what we would love to be by federal or state or local governments or whoever um be strong be bold be be safe look after each other and just continue making great art so thank you everyone for, everyone for joining us thank you panelists thank you jazz festival thanks everyone thanks Dean. Thank thanks you. everyone <laughs> thanks bye bye